afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm going to give you a, a fairly short presentation to, to talk you through uh, Serica Energy and what we do. Um, there will be less, um, less numbers and less um, um, revenue figures um, in, in this presentation than you've seen in the last two. Um, and that's deliberate. We're trying to just concentrate on helping the market understand what we do as a company and what differentiates us from other oil and gas companies. Because there are a lot of oil and gas companies out there um, and we're not all the same. And occasionally that, that, that gets lost a little bit. Um, you won't be able to read that, you're glad to, I'm glad to say. So we're just going to concentrate on, on what we do. Um, we're now one of the top 10 UK oil and gas producers. Um, all of our activity is in the UK North Sea. Um, we're involved now in 11 producing fields uh, throughout the North Sea, based really in two areas. We have a kind of a, a major hub in the northern North Sea uh, around Bruce, um, and we have a, um, a, a, a second hub, which we've only just recently acquired in, in the central North Sea uh, around Triton. Um, we, we operate, the, the industry works on a, a partnership basis. We've, we've talked about that in some of the other things we've seen today, but we tend to operate, and so we run um, at least 80% of the production that, that, um, that we're involved in. And I'll come back to why that is important to us. Um, we've got a staff of around uh, 200 people based in, uh, a few of us in London, um, mainly in Aberdeen uh, and, and offshore. And, and what we do is we produce oil and gas. We don't generally develop new oil and gas fields. We tend to buy assets that are in the middle of their life that have quite often been the subject of, of huge investment um, from the majors, from the BPs, Shells, Exxons of this world. We tend to buy assets when they're getting to the age that those majors can no longer extract appropriate value from those assets. So basically, when they get to the stage in their life that they're not material to a major, and the, the, the majors cannot give the assets the, the, the TLC, the, the focus and attention that, that, that they really need. So we are a mid to late life um, production company. So what does that mean? Why does that work? Why is that a niche? Why, why can we do that? And I'll give you an example of an asset that we purchased uh, a long time ago now. So this is back in 2014. We purchased a, a minority share in this case, a non-operated share uh, in a field called Erskine. Um, and uh, that was, uh, we bought this interest from BP um, and it was a fairly small deal. When you look at the size of the company now, and I'll come back to where we are right now, we were buying what was assessed to be 3.6 million barrels of, uh, of, of oil and gas. You'll see me talking quite often about BOE here, that means barrels of oil equivalent. So we've got a lot of gas and a lot of oil, and we kind of, to, to, to try and make this a, an easy number, we'll convert the gas into oil and, and talk about barrels of oil equivalent. All of the numbers that I'll give you have been independently verified. So I'm not just saying that, that we've done this and we've done that. We get an independent verification. It's the way the industry works. Uh, we have a thing called a CPR, which is a competent person's report. So we get an independent person to come in and assess the, 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 the amount of reserves that are left in any one field at any one time. So when we bought Erskine in 2014, the independent assessment was that there were 3.6 million barrels of oil equivalent left in that field. Um, we've been producing that for over eight years now, um, and we've produced 5.58 million barrels by, by the start of this year. So we bought 3.6, we've already produced the best part of 5.6, so we've produced 150% of what was, what was supposed to be there. We still have these CPRs done on an annual basis, and on the last CPR at the start of this year, there was still 3.3 million barrels left. So we started with 3.6, we've still got 3.3, and we've produced over 5 million. And that, in a, 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 a roundabout way, illustrates exactly what our model is. Because we can get more value out of these assets by having you know, really sharp, good technical people that are fully focused on getting the most possible value out of these assets, which will extend the life, we drive the, the costs down, we extend the life of these assets, and we get more oil and gas out of the ground. So that's been achieved without drilling any new wells. So we haven't had to go into this and, and find new reserves. It's just proving that we can e exploit the existing reserves in the best possible way. 
So, so that was the first deal we did. That was a deal we did in 2014. It was non-operated. Um, and we went then to look for our next deal. And we did, the next deal we did was an operated set of assets. Um, three assets uh, joined together called Bruce, Keith and Rum. I won't go through the, the technical details of how it works. But I'll give you a, a shorter, a, another example of how we've added value to those assets. One of those fields, so there were three fields, Bruce, Keith, and Rum. One of those fields uh, is called Rum. It's the most valuable of the three fields. It's the biggest of the three fields. We uh, assumed the operatorship. We bought this asset in 2018. It's a really, really prolific gas field. It, in, in, its, in itself, it produces 4 or 5% of the UK's gas. So this is a really important, it's, it's a, a, a national strategic importance. The, the production plot there, and this is going to get more confusing, so this is in, because it's gas, this is in cubic feet per day or millions of cubic feet per day. This would be the normal sort of decline you would see. I mean, this is, this is physics of, uh, uh, of an oil and gas field. They will decline, the rates will decline in time. It's like when you take the, the, the top off of a can of pop um, or a bottle of, uh, a bottle of pop, you'll see that it, it'll come out very quickly at the start and it'll slow down in time. So, so generally, the pressure, the pressure declines and the flow rate declines. And if you do nothing, that's what a field will look like. So I, 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 I generally work on a rule of thumb that, that most of the fields we operate decline by approximately 10% per year in, in terms of the amount of oil and gas that you get out of them. And if you allow that to continue, um, it will just continue declining. Uh, and this field, when we bought it, was due to have finished production by 2026, I think. So we bought it in 2018. It would have been profitable even if we'd run it to 2026, but we believed we could extend the life of that. One of the things that had happened was that, that as I said, it's a prolific field. It had been producing from just two wells. So it's produced 5% of the UK's gas from two wells. It is really, really prolific. BP, who developed this field and, and had started producing it in 2004, had originally planned that it would be from three wells. So they drilled three wells. They had problems with the third well and basically couldn't be bothered to, to, to solve those problems. And I, I'm, I'm not doing BP a disservice. If they were here, they would say exactly the same. It wasn't material for them to get after those, those problems. It was material for us because we believed we could really create a lot of value, add a lot of money for our shareholders by getting that third well back into production. And so we did. Uh, and that's what the, what the, what the performance looked like. Um, and I can tell you that, that you know, we, we've managed, we're still doing other things. This was up until the end of last year, um, where it declined to, we were back at about 190 million cubic feet per day. I know that today we were back up at 200. We're still continuing to do work. So by going back in and applying focus, having a good set of engineers, and applying the focus, we've managed to add value to an asset that that value wouldn't have been created by the previous owners. They'd had it for, for 10, 12 years and hadn't done this. More importantly, what that does now, that means that this, this field will continue operating way beyond the 2026 that it was, that it was, it was planned to be shut down. We think now with the work we're doing, and again, this is independently assessed, so this is not just me saying it, the independent assessment is that we will now get this running until 2035. So we've added a huge amount of, of, of value to this, to this asset. Um, and again, we're on our way, as I, as I showed with the previous example, we're on our way to actually producing probably double uh, what we bought um, by the time that we've got through to the end of field life. So this is what we do. It's not particularly high-tech. I would love to say that we have a proprietary skill or a proprietary technology that means that we can go out and do this better than anyone else, but that's not true. What we do is we go out and we have a great team of, of technical experts. We back those guys and we get after it and we do things quickly. We have a very, very short decision-making um, um, uh, routine so that we can actually get out and do these things very quickly. Um, and incidentally, and I, I, mean, I, I think ESG is becoming one of those things we shouldn't mention as, a, as ESG, so I'll talk about the environmental impact of what we've done. Because I think one thing that we're really proud of, if we overlay on that the orange curve, and I hope this shows up, I don't know if it shows up particularly well from the back, the orange curve um, is, is our total CO2 output from the processing plant that actually runs this. Um, and hopefully if you squint, and certainly if I look at it from this direction, um, the the total CO2 is on a downward trend throughout that, whatever it is, four-year period, despite the fact that we're actually producing 50% more than we were at that stage. So 
the emissions per barrel of oil or per foot, cubic foot of gas have gone down because we've got that equipment out there. We, 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 we're, we're running those compressors, we're running those turbines, but we're putting more oil and gas through it and we're running them more efficiently and so we're getting our overall emissions down. So again, not only are we adding value, not only are we extending the life, but we're doing it in a, an environmentally um, uh, conscious manner, which we have to do. I mean, the, the industry we're in has a, a license to operate and we, we have to maintain that license to operate by improving our, our emissions. And this goes a long, long way to, 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 to doing that. So it's another example of having a, a dedicated team, putting those people to work, um, giving them the ability, uh, backing them with investment so that we can actually extend the life and add value to these, uh, to, to these fields. Some, and I know that this plot, because I, I, I actually stood at the back of the room and tried to see this, and you can't, I know you can't see anything of this, uh, of this map, but it's, it's, uh, this, this is showing um, a piece of work that we've done more recently. This is within the last year. Um, this is a map uh, of, of an oil field. Um, so the, um, the, the, the red bits in the middle are, are, are the higher part. It's like an upturned saucer, if you like. Um, and, and the trap of, it's a very conventional, old-fashioned oil field that is, uh, the extent of it is marked by this, this blue line here. The original wells, we won't be able to see this, there's a, a kind of platform up here. The original wells were these black lines that were drilled, and they were all focused on the, on, on the highest part of the structure. So, you know, it's kind of saying, you, you've got a structure that looks like this, we'll stick all the wells in the top because that's where you've got the best chance of finding, uh, finding oil and gas. We've got a lot of subsurface engineers who look at the, the geophysical data, who look at the data that we've applied, that we've, we've acquired from those wells. And those wells were all drilled five, ten years ago, um, at least. Um, and no work had been done by the previous operator on this field. Our guys looked at, at, at the data from these wells and looked at the size of this field and said, well, hang on, you know, not all the oil and gas is going to be up here. We think there's going to be some in the, in, the, in the bottom section of this field. And there isn't a well in the bottom section of this field. So we're trying to drain the oil and gas from down here through wells that are up there. That just physically doesn't, doesn't work very well. That oil and gas has got to travel so far. So, and it's a big leap of faith, but we were able to give those engineers, those, those geophysicists, those, those geologists, we backed them by saying, we'll drill another well. We'll drill a well that comes down here, so it's this white well, which you might not be able to see, which comes down here uh, and drills into this, this southern portion of the field. Now, the previous owners of this field, again, this was bought from Shell and Exxon 10, 15 years ago, not by us, but by there was an intermediate owner. Um, the previous owners just couldn't be bothered. I mean, it was too much of a risk to actually drill that well. The well probably cost, I don't know, $30, $40 million, but we did it. And, and what we found in the bottom of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the field was what we expected, good quality sands with a lot of oil in them, but what we actually found was that the, the, the quality of those sands was better than we expected. The, the porosity and permeability, so the ability to flow oil and gas out of those, was even better than we expected. That well came into production um, earlier this year. Um, prior to that, the entire field was producing around three to 4,000 barrels a day. That well, when we put it onto production itself, produced 10,000 barrels of oil a day. So it's a huge, huge uplift. And again, it plays back into the environmental story because that well, we tie back to the existing infrastructure, to the existing pipelines, the existing pumps, the existing compressors. So we're not creating any additional CO2 in order to produce that. We are just adding value. We're just creating money, basically. Um, and we, again, with that, will extend the life of that field because today that field is producing... 12,000 barrels a day combined, whereas it was producing 4,000 at the start of this year. So that field will remain economically viable for much, much longer. I don't have a date on that yet because this is so new that we've not had the CPR done on this to actually tell me where the numbers go. But these are just examples, and, and, and I've, I've, there's a whole bunch of other examples of, of, of what we can do where a smaller company, a more focused, a more nimble company can come in, make decisions, uh, and very quickly move on to, uh, to, to add value to, to, to the fields. 
So, I mean, how does this, how does this manifest itself? I, mean, I, I doubt if you'll be able to see the numbers. This is a, I've talked a lot about the CPR. So this is our independently re uh, assessed reserves. So this is the CPR reserve. So at the end of each year, we get, you know, it's like you, you put in your homework and the, and the headmaster says, right, you've now got, um, well, at the end of last year, it was 75 million barrels of oil um, left to, um, to produce. So four years ago, we had 68 million barrels of oil. We've now got 74. So in those four years, we've added to, to what we've got in the ground. But in that period, we've produced 30 million barrels of oil, over 30 million barrels of oil. So if, you know, if we'd done nothing, we would have started off with 68, we would have produced 30, we'd be left with, with you know, 38, simple maths. Um, we're not. We're actually left with 74. We got more than we started with um, over that four years, and we've produced 30 million barrels. You know, we all know the cost of oil, the average price of oil during that period has probably been $60, $70. So you could do the maths and see that, that this is incredibly cash generative. You'll also see um, um, up here in orange, um, the, we made an acquisition at the end of last year. Because we can't go on recreating this trick year after year. Eventually, every field will run out of oil and gas. Um, every mine will run out of, um, uh, 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 of the metals that you need. So we do have to continue to replenish the hopper, if you like. And we do need, um, we need to be able to have more fields and more assets that we can do the same thing with, that we can continue to invest to, to, to create more value. So at the end of last year, um, we did a deal where we, um, we, bought some, we bought the assets of a company called Tailwind. Um, Slightly smaller company than ourselves, but really with the same in the same sector in the same market, driven to do the same things that we do. So with a good basket of assets and some good engineers and some good brains with ways to, to, to improve those assets. So now with the 75 million barrels that we ended uh, last year and the 55 that we've just bought, uh, we now have 130 million barrels um, uh, still in the ground. And I'm confident we will continue to increase that. There were some lovely um, footnotes on, on uh, Karen's uh, note earlier about past performance is not necessarily a reliable indicator of future returns. And you may not have been able to see those if you were at the back, but I was at the front and I could see those. And, and I would argue that in this case, technically, past performance is an indicator that we can continue to do this. And we can do this in the future because I've only put four years on here, but we've been doing this now for eight years. We've been increasing reserves year on year. Um, and technically, we can continue to do that. Now, there are lots of other things that come into our business. And you know, commodity prices are all over the place. Tax, tax rates are all over the place. I'm deliberately not going there on this. But I'll happily ask questions, uh, answer questions afterwards. But we focus very much on extending the life of our assets and adding value um, by, by replacing those reserves. So why did we do that, that transaction? And uh, conscious of the fact that I've not got a lot of time left, I'm not going to go through this. We did want to, to diversify our portfolio. We, were too, we had too much gas in our old portfolio, portfolio which was great, um, because gas has been fantastic the, from, from, from the pricing perspective in the last few years. But we saw that gas wasn't going to stay like that. And so we were quite happy to bring more oil into the portfolio. So now we've got a really nicely balanced portfolio. We're almost exactly 50-50 between oil and gas, which each gives us a hedge against the other, because the gas and oil prices move uh, in independently. Um, we've, we've increased our reserves. We've got now you know, two totally independent areas. So we're no longer dependent upon the risk of uh, you know, a technical problem in, in one area bringing us down or a pipeline problem in one area bringing us down. Um, and we, we basically have, so we, we, we've, we've diversified, we've mitigated any risks that we had in the company. We now are one of the top 10 producers, which gives us scale, which gives us increased income, which positions us even better to do more acquisitions. So we're not going to stop at this stage. We want to continue to grow the portfolio so we've got more assets in the portfolio, so we can, we've got more toys to play with. We can continue to do this on, on, on more and more assets. And there are more assets out there in the North Sea. There are a number of assets that are just not economic for the majors to work on. And, and we think we can step in and, and, and do those. Um, I mean, this is, this is just puff pieces, really. But uh, I mean, this kind of shows uh, you know, where we sit. Um, you know, in the first quarter of this year, well, this year to date, we're producing, um, in fact, we will be the eighth biggest at the moment. I think we're producing about 48, 49,000 at the moment. Um, but we are moving uh, rapidly up um, the scale of, uh, of, the, of the, the UK producers. 
Um, this kind of gives you a, a bit of a picture, and I need to stand away to be able to see this. Kind of gives, gives you a bit of a picture of, of, of what our performance looks like. This was just in the first quarter of this year. Um, so this is production. This is daily production. It scares a lot of people when you look at this because it shows you the, the variability in what we have to do. But this is what, this is what we do. We, we, we run older assets and we focus on them, and, and you have things that change on a daily basis. But the overall picture you'll see here, the, um, this kind of, I don't know how to describe this, this light brown color is the Gannett field that I talked about earlier, that at the start of the year was doing about 4,000 barrels a day. Um, by the end of the first, first quarter, was up to 12,000 barrels a day. So that's bringing that new well in. And you'll see that's brought our overall production. For a time, we were over 60,000 barrels a day towards the end of the, end of the quarter when we got that. The, the important thing, the thing I like about this plot is it shows why diversity works because the, the, the brown curves are the X tailwind assets, the blue curves are the X serica assets, and you can see that we've, both of them have had periods when they've had shutdowns and outages, so the, there was hardly any production from the tailwind assets during that period there, and we've had a few periods when we've had you know, bad performance from the, the X serica assets. But if you put them all together, there's, there hasn't been a single day during that period when we've had a, a total shutdown. There hasn't been a single day where we've gone below, I think it's 25,000 BOE per day. So that gives us more certainty, um, and on a longer scale, it gives you, it gives you more confidence. It, it, it allows you to maintain your payments of dividends. It allows you to maintain your payments of, uh, of capital expenditure, and it, it, it enables you to, to, to run the business um, 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 from a more secure platform. Um, I, I won't talk about this because I know that I'm running out of time. Um, this kind of illustrates, though, the, the variability we've seen in gas prices and the fact that gas, which is blue, and, uh, and, and oil, which is the orange curve here, you know, don't always move the same. Uh, and that's why we wanted to have that, uh, that diversity. Um, so the outlook is we're going to stay above 40,000 barrels a day of production, and I would hope we'll be above 50,000 barrels a day. Um, and we're going to continue to look for new opportunities to grow this portfolio. We've got ourselves in a position where we can, where we can do that and will do that. So at that stage, I'll um, turn it across to uh, questions. Excellent. Thank you. You've certainly got a question already. So. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've been a shareholder in Seraph since May 2008. Congratulations. So for 15 years <laughs> I've been following the company. Congratulations. A lot of downs and some yeah. ups and there we are at the moment. Um, but I think there are, there are two main issues at the moment which private investors are, are, are focused on. Um, one is the takeover of Tailwind, yep. which brought Mercury into the, uh, yep. into the equation. And I think a lot of private investors thought that Mercury may have got the better end of the deal there. They're a, a very big company, they're sharp, they're sharp elbowed people. And I think a lot of people thought maybe they, they've got the best end of the deal. So that's something you can maybe comment on. Yeah. Um, the second issue, of course, is the, uh, the recent uh, ta tax regime in, in the UK. I mean, I think Serica now is on a P ratio of about two times. It's mm -hmm. yielding maybe 10%. But if all those profits are going to be taken by the government, then it, 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 it diminishes the attraction as, a, as an investment prospect. And rolling into that, the recent news that I think Harbour are now... Um, Talking about M and A in America and moving some of their operations there. I mean, are they are they just rat rattling their um, elbows to try and shake the government of a what? But and would that have any effect on you? So okay. there are a couple of big issues. I don't think we want detailed answers, but I think from a private investor point of view, these are these are the things that they're looking at I more than anything. To else. Totally Thank understand, you. and they're they're all valid points, and I could probably spend uh, another thirty minutes speaking about about those. Um, I think the um, the. The, I mean, we're aware very much of the, um, uh, of the argument that, um, that Mercuria got the better end of that deal. Um, I totally, I, I mean, I'm totally in, in the opposite camp. I think it was a fantastic deal for us. I think we've shown the, the production there that is working very well. And if you look at where gas prices were when we, when we announced that deal, gas prices are now something like 30% uh, of where they were, so they're 70% down from that time. If we had stayed as a gas-focused company, things would be looking pretty grim right now. We, we have managed to diversify successfully so that we brought oil into the portfolio. The oil price during that period has stayed fairly, fairly stable, um, and we're now benefit, benefiting from the, the income from those oil fields, 
which are producing ahead of our expectation, um, such that, as, as I showed there, we're producing up to 60,000 barrels uh, on many days. A lot of that is now sheltered from tax because we got tax sh shelter that came in with the tailwind deal. So we're getting far more income, um, it's tax efficient, and we have, as you will have seen, um, also already increased the reserves, the 2P reserves that, that, that were there in Tailwind. So, you know, again, without getting too technical, there was a number on there that I showed was 55 million was the, was the orange part of that bar. Um, a year ago, that was 42 million. So we're increasing the reserves in that Tailwind asset. So we've bought a, a, a spectacular set of assets that are performing very well. So the argument that, that somehow Mercuria got the best end of that deal is one that I, I can't really subscribe to. Um, what else did you ask? You asked about tax. Um, yeah, I mean, no one likes paying more tax. Um, however, I feel that with our model, and I've kind of demonstrated that we're, we're doing a lot of what we call short cycle investments. So we're not doing investments where it's not like one of these big West of Shetland investments you'll read a lot about, um, the, you know, Cambo and, uh, and, and other fields, West of Shetlands, where people are investing money for a long period of time before they get a payback. So they're actually putting their capital at risk for a long period of time. Our investments are a series of short cycle investments that pay back, some of these things pay back in, in, in months, um, uh, in weeks in some cases, but, but certainly we're, we're not, so we, we know what we're doing in terms of we can see whether our investment is, is going to pay back because we're not at the vagaries of future tax changes. Uh, and that's the problem with this tax regime is it is stifling investment in long-term projects because no one will commit to a project that has a 10-year payback. We can commit to projects that have a six-month or a one-year payback because we can, you know, we can see what the tax regime is and we can make that work. We were very profitable last year. I mean, if you're, you're a shareholder, you, you will know that. And we're paying a very big dividend this year on the back of, uh, of what we made last year. And you know, the windfall tax was there last year. We were still very, very profitable. We'll be more profitable on a percentage basis this year because we've got tax, tax allowances as well. So yeah, I don't, like the, I don't like the increased tax, but the allowances that come with it actually enable us to continue to invest. Um, and we are still profitable at these, at these levels. We've got several questions, but I think one, one just here, first of all. Mm -hmm. Right. Hello. Uh, Hi. Well, that was a most interesting talk. Thank you. Although I had already known most of it. Um, I'm more interested in share price, okay. as I think most of us are. Yep. Uh, I received some research on your company about four or five weeks ago, which suggested that the present share price was eight was lower than it by 82% on a discounted cash flow. Yep. They explained that it's not the best method of evaluation, but it was, in this particular case, an important figure. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an issue that, um, that the industry has. This is not just a Serica issue. Um, we've done some, some internal research, and I'm not going to give you the numbers, but... There are, you know, if you look at, at, at our peers, and there aren't many peers in, in, in the market at the moment, um, we actually sit at about an average um, discount to, to NAV. So we do look at our market cap and compare our market cap to NAV, and which really annoys me, you know, because I think we're an above average company. Um, and I think what we need to do, and that's part of the reason that a lot of what I'm doing here is talking about the, the, the return that we've made over a number of years and the fact that we're adding value over a number of years. I think that gets lost um, to a lot of investors um, and it's something we, I have to do better oops, excuse me, to get that story across there because I think that long-term performance is what sets us apart and what means we can say we are doing better than a lot of our peers. Um, unfortunately though, the whole market gets marked down as a, 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 as a uh, you know, in, in, in one foul swoop, and that's, that's, that's frustrating. So, yeah, we've got to get out there. That's one of the reasons I do these. It's one of the reasons, you know, I'm not just here to do this today. I'm here to talk to institu institutional investors that are, that are based in, in, in Edinburgh because we've got to get this story out there because it frustrates me, I tell you, that, that we're at that, that discount to, to, to NAV. Yes, this research actually suggested that their target figure was a 42% drop from the discounted cash flow, which basically means a doubling of value. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, we've got a question. But any, any, I know... any CEO would tell you that his company is undervalued. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm not unusual in that. So. <laughs> absolutely. All right. uh, look, thanks for that. Um, interesting. This is about funding. So there's some very high profile sort of stories around, say, some of the big banks like Lloyd's removing funding from um, the oil and gas industry. I would have thought this would be a great, a great opportunity for an organisation like yourself maybe a bit smaller, nimbler, can look at other places to get um, funding. What, where are your funding sources coming from? How much of it's debt? How much of it's institutional money? So, so we're a, a net cash company. We, we, we do have a small amount of debt on the books. Um, that came with the Tailwind transaction, but we have more cash in the bank than we have debt on, on, on the other side. The deals that we've done that I talked about, the Erskine deal and the, and the BKR deal, were both done from really you know, innovative um, uh, deal making um, and we didn't take on debt for either of those. So at the moment we've got cash we've, and that means not only have we got cash but we've got huge amount of debt capacity, well, uh, some debt capacity. I mean it's, no one's got huge debt capacity at the moment because as you say there are rumours, and I'm not going to confirm or deny, there are rumours that some banks are moving out of lending to, to, to oil and gas. So we believe that we can continue with, with our M&A, we can do more deals with the cash that we've got, with the cash flow that we've got, which is incredible, with innovative deal making and with a, an element of debt. So, you know, we haven't been back to the market, we haven't raised funds from the market for over 10 years and we've got absolutely no intention of doing so. Thank you.